The political landscape in Canada is taking an unexpectedly theatrical turn, with tensions escalating into a spectacle of power struggles that have left citizens both bewildered and intrigued. But the real show is in the back rooms where whispers are growing louder, pushing for Justin Trudeau to bid a fond farewell to leadership. Our dear Canadians are left wondering, is this the beginning of a liberal renaissance or just another chapter of musical chairs for a captain less ship? The political stakes have never felt higher, and the precarious position of the liberals offers a rare glimpse into the vulnerability of a party once considered an unshakable force. While some view the unfolding saga as a source of entertainment, others anticipate significant ramifications for the nation's future trajectory. Stick around as we delve deeper into the plot twists of Canadian political theater, starring none other than our sitting prime minister, his new team, and a party teetering on the brink of an identity crisis. The drama merely a spectacle to some, hints at broader implications for the nation's path forward. Welcome back to Street Politics Canada. In a move reminiscent of rearranging deck chairs on a sinking ship, the Liberal Party has brought Andrew Bevan on board as the national campaign director. Bevan's credentials are as solid as they come, after all, Anyone who can survive as Kathleen Wynne's chief of staff through two elections deserves some recognition. This decision, however, comes with its own set of challenges and expectations. But as Trudeau mentions with enthusiasm, Bevan will steer progressive priorities, a term which lately seems to translate to, trust us, we'll sort things out soon. This has sparked a wave of speculation and debate. Is Bevan really the fresh thinker needed to rejuvenate the party, or is he yet another piece in a complicated political puzzle? Some are speculating Bevan's appointment is a strategic attempt to convince Canadians that the Liberals still have the upper hand, even though the party's poll numbers suggest otherwise, signaling turmoil beneath a calm surface. An air of nostalgia surrounds the Liberals' current dilemma, echoing past scandals and leadership scrambles that have left a mark on their public image. The echoes of political turbulence seem to haunt them still. MPs have been meeting in rooms all across Parliament Hill and they're being asked to sign their names to what amounts to a pledge to stand together and calling for Trudeau to resign. This is by far the most advanced effort that we have seen to this point and it's really escalated throughout this week with Justin Trudeau overseas at this summit in Asia. And what sort of reaction are we expecting from the Prime Minister? Right now it is still very unclear how Justin Trudeau responds once he's back in Canada. Taking a closer look at the internal turmoil, there's a certain irony in the fact that the former campaign director, Jeremy Broadhurst, stepped down citing personal reasons. This abrupt exit has left many liberal MPs pondering over the party's trajectory, questioning if there is more to Broadhurst's departure than meets the eye. With the NDP pulling the plug on their supply and confidence agreement, the stakes have never been higher for the liberals. One can only imagine the water-cooler conversations among liberal MPs, especially at that so-called secret caucus. Could it be that secret meetings are now necessary because open ones have grown stale and unproductive? These clandestine gatherings only add to the air of mystery and tension, as private conversations slowly morph into public debates that both intrigue and baffle the common observer. The party's internal workings are becoming as fascinating as the public spectacle they cast. Meanwhile, the Trudeau loyalists insist on telling Justin about the letter going around that calls for a revaluation of his leadership. In what feels like a scene pulled from a political thriller, Trudeau learned of these discussions on his way back from the ASEAN summit, where he, quite quaintly, was with his son trying to catch fish in the Mekong River, a perfectly metaphorical setting for his attempts at luring in international trade. Yet despite his efforts to champion Canada's trading partnerships in Southeast Asia, concerns at home are surely harder to ignore than the tiny Mekong fish he tried teasing out of the water. His attempts to reinforce his international appeal feel more like a distraction from the domestic disarray he's been unable to quell. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be joining you here in Vientiane to start because this is the first time a Canadian Prime Minister has visited Laos, but also because we've had a highly productive time here at what is my third consecutive ASEAN summit, a summit made successful and possible by our gracious and welcoming Laotian hosts led by Prime Minister Sipan Don. But before I get into it today, I want to, take, I want to talk about the fact uh, that our national pharmacare bill, Bill C-64, just got royal assent. This is a big deal and great news for many Canadians. It means free insulin is coming for every Canadian who needs it, ensuring that they don't have to choose between putting food on the table and getting the life-saving medication they require. And it means we'll be providing prescription contraceptives for free because we not only believe in a woman's right to choose, but we act on it. This is real progress, but now we need the provinces and territories to come to the table and sign agreements with us 
that supports Canadians and takes pressure off their household budgets as soon as possible. I've also seen the devastating images from the ground in the U.S. after Hurricane Milton made landfall yesterday. My heart goes out to everyone affected by this tragic disaster. I know Canadians are already rolling up their sleeves, some there to restore power, others there to help neighbours in need. Uh, we are all thinking of our friends to the south. Today we're here in Laos because when we formed government, we made a commitment to invest in Canada's relationship in the Indo-Pacific, to invest in strengthening ties with ASEAN, because these relationships matter. They matter because in an increasingly complex and unstable world, strong partnerships built on mutual trust are the only way we can create a safe and prosperous future. They matter because we need to be skating where the puck is going. ASEAN is the fastest growing region in the world and plays a central, a central consensus building role, not just here in Asia, but around the globe. And in just a few years, we're all seeing remarkable results. Since 2015, Canada's trade with ASEAN has nearly doubled. And that didn't happen by accident. It happened because our trade ministers, particularly Mary, has led many successful trade missions to the region with hundreds of Canadian businesses. As Canada's trade with ASEAN countries jumps to significant figures, one can't help but wonder if Trudeau feels more home abroad. While he might enjoy sharing a dinner table with global leaders, the Canadian electorate is more fixated on the political kitchen fires back in Ottawa. In his absence, his party seems to host events of its own, a caucus without its chief present. Perhaps the real question is whether Trudeau's international escapades are a means of escape from the growing discontent brewing among his own ranks. The juxtaposition of local dissonance and international presence raises eyebrows. What exactly is being prioritized here? With mounting pressure at home and a global eye on Canada's role in international politics, the turbulence within the party is palpable, raising the stakes for electoral prospects on the near horizon. As Canadians witness this duality of focus from afar, the political theatre in Ottawa continues to stir emotions and questions alike. As the Liberal Party attempts to navigate stormy waters, the arrival of Andrew Bevan could be a milestone or merely a ripple in a sea of uncertainty. Will Bevan be the catalyst for revitalization or just another actor in the grand performance that is Canadian politics? Whether the whispers for Trudeau's exit will transform into a public clamor remains to be seen. Meanwhile, those outside the capital might be left chuckling at this theatrical political performance, yet deeply concerned about Canada's direction. Is the Liberal Party truly aiming for rejuvenation, or are they merely chasing their tails while the opposition keenly observes, waiting for their moment? I think I speak for uh, Manitoba Caucus that uh, we are 100% uh, supportive of the Prime Minister going forward as our leader. The Prime Minister is committed to leading us into the next election, and he has our support. The Prime Minister uh, is the person that is the best place to take the fight to Pierre Poliev. The landscape is ripe for change, or perhaps mere continuity wrapped in fresh promises, leaving Canadians at a crossroads waiting eagerly or anxiously for what's next. Regardless of where one stands politically, the unfolding narrative is bound to be as intriguing as they come. Will Canadians witness positive change, or is it simply business as usual with a new cast and new promises? Canadians are keenly observing the political fodder, patiently or impatiently, awaiting resolutions that align with the nation's best interests. The significance of this moment cannot be understated as Canadians reflect on their political values and the potential path forward. Will Bevan steer the ship through these turbulent times, or will the current Liberal efforts amount to nothing more than an exercise in futility? Well, that's all for now. Do you think Trudeau will get ejected by his own liberals eventually? Let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't, please subscribe and leave a like for this video. Your support helps us continue our work. You can also follow us on Twitter, where we post stuff we can't post on YouTube. You can find the link in the description below. Thanks again for your support, and I will see you in the next one.